grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have any stats to back this up. I guess you'll have to take this as a homiletical mystery, right? But I venture to guess that the one single question that God gets asked more than anything else is why? Why, God? Why me? Why this? Why now? Why not the other? Why? I've been there far more than I care to probably count. Far more than I care to admit. And I say this only because such questioning of God, although very natural and normal and frequent and common, especially nowadays, it does betray a bit of unfaithfulness, a lack of trust on the part of the question. I know that might rub you a little bit the wrong way, but nevertheless it's true. We just think about our own experiences in everyday life. If someone is constantly questioning you, do they trust you? And well, it works both ways. You can't say those people who constantly question you don't trust you if then you go around and do it to God yourself. In the words of the prophet Nathan, you are the man. And so am I. Now today being Holy Trinity Sunday, it does us good to meditate on what it means to trust God above all things. Now for starters, who is God? Who is this God that we claim to trust? Well, we confess it every single Sunday when we use the words of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or, as we will speak today, the Athanasian. We confess, that is, we say what is true, and we agree with Scripture that he is triune. That is, he is three in one. Not three separate gods, but one God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, all-righteous, all-merciful, all-loving. That's a lot of alls. Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing. The Latin prefix that we use for that is om, as in omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. You get the idea. Our appointed lesson for today then speaks to all of these omni-realities. For instance, we look to Isaiah and we see a very clear image of all power, omnipotent, omnipresent God in his heavenly throne. The train of his robe fills the heaven in the smoke-filled temple. The very foundations of the thresholds of heaven shake when God speaks. The whole scene that Isaiah describes speaks of the power, the might, the fullness of God. And we get all that, right? God's omnipotence isn't ever really an issue with us. We know he's all-powerful. We know he's omnipresent. We know that he's always with us. We know that he's omniscient. That is, he knows everything all the time. He knows what we're going through. He knows our hearts. He knows us better than we do. None of that's really a problem for us. We get it. We understand it. We believe it. But what about God's wisdom? God doesn't always seem very wise in our eyes. He works all things for good for those who love him, but I know that I would do things a little differently if, well, if I had to. God's ways don't always seem very efficient, very effective, or even very wise. And this is one place where we struggle. Why doesn't God use all that power to heal us, to relieve all of our sufferings? Why doesn't God make a king? He's got the power. Why doesn't he just make it so? That doesn't seem very wise. Why doesn't God work a miracle and make cancer vanish? Wouldn't that be a lot more effective at getting people to come to faith? 
rather than subjecting them to cruelty and misery, that is, cancer. A simple common sense says that you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And wouldn't that sweet honey of prosperity and abundance and wellness work a lot better at making Christians than the miserable cross and the suffering that he allows us to endure? Why doesn't God make all those terrorists repent and just become Christians? Surely he could do it if he really wanted. After all, he spoke all of creation into existence out of nothingness. Surely he could say the word. He could snap his finger and make everything all that. He doesn't. Instead, he lets a bunch of demon-worshipping fools slaughter innocent people. And a lot of people are getting turned off on religion altogether because of God's inaction. And yet... He still does nothing. That's not very wise. Why? Why don't you do something? Well, St. Paul gives the answer. He wrote to the Christians in Rome who were being persecuted, who were being hunted down and slaughtered simply because they were Christians. St. Paul points these suffering ones to the incomprehensible wisdom the almighty and all-powerful God. He says, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. We might read that and think that he's lamenting. Oh, the depth and the riches. How inscrutable. But instead, actually, he's saying this is praise. Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Let that sink. Those Christians in Rome being hunted down and slaughtered. They're the main event of the Colosseum. They're the fuel for the city's lamps. It is not good. Nothing like the persecution that we, that we talk about in America where, where people give you dirty looks, where they shun you, where they say mean things. No, this is full-on life-ending persecution. Times are tough for these Christians. They're literally being forced underground, holding worship in the catacombs, in the underground cemeteries. They're questioning God's wisdom. They're asking why. Why is this happening? Why isn't God doing something about it? But here's the thing. St. Paul answered. Well, he doesn't attempt to give an answer for God. Paul doesn't delve into theodicy. That is, the practice of trying to give the answer for God and explain why he is doing or acting in a certain way. St. Paul doesn't do what we so often or even what we so often desire. His answer to the age-old question, why, is simply to point to God's unsearchable and inscrutable wisdom. God is far smarter than any of us, and he knows what he's doing. Amen. Now, I know we all believe this, but it's far easier to believe when things are going well enough instead of when hit those bumps. Things hit the skids and you see and you look around and all there is is darkness and death and despair and fear and sorrow. When you're depressed, when you're in pain, when life is in the sewer, you're emotionally eviscerated when you're feeling the crushing weight of the crosses that you bear. Hearing that God's wisdom is at work and he's in control and he knows what he's doing, well that doesn't exactly come across. It's very comforting. Sometimes it comes across as very harsh, a law-filled punch to the nose. It's meant as God's way, but it's heard as very condemning law. God knows exactly what he's doing, too. This is where the words of Christ himself in our gospel lesson show us what God's almighty and power 
is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, this is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God hung on the cross for all to see. Here is the unsearchable, the inscrutable wisdom of God. Here is what it's all about. Here is where our every problem, our every worry, our every concern, our every woe is ultimately directed and answered. Here is the fullest expression of God's powerful love, not just for you, but for all of you, even the ones that you don't like. And this is wisdom that only God can have. Who would ever draw up the plan of salvation that looks like this? Who would ever draw up a plan of faith and victory and love and peace to look like death, to look like defeat, to look like forsakenness and horrific suffering? Who? Who indeed God, that is, the very God who desires the death of no man who desires instead that all would turn and repent and confess their sins and hold fast to him and in his all-loving, all-merciful peace would dwell. The peace that is found only in the all-atoning sacrifice of God himself in the flesh, Christ Jesus. Now again, I know that you know this already. I didn't just reveal to you some, some previously unknown secret and yet, how often do we forget? How often does fatigue, and clouds of despair, and fear kick up and we get blinded, deafened to this cruciform truth, this cruciform peace? How often do we say, why? 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 Why not? We want answers. If we're honest, we actually demand answers. With tears, with anger. We say why. I'm not even going to try to give you that answer. To why you might be suffering. Or why the other guy is doing so well. I'm not going to give you false or bad advice. No matter how much we really want to hear it. And you might scoff at that, but it does happen from time to time. People often prefer the lie. The lie doesn't offend. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't ruffle feathers or rock the boat. It tells you exactly what you want to hear. The lie is more preferable. It's more powerful than the truth. But I won't do that. I can't do that. Here is the truth. Here is Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the wisdom, the love, mercy, the righteousness of Almighty God in the flesh. In fact, here is the Trinity at work for you and your salvation. The Almighty Father still sends his Son to you to bring you his assurance of forgiveness, grace, mercy, peace. No matter how foolishly bad things may seem on this side of eternity, those who have seen me have seen the Father. The only begotten Son still holds out his pierced hand to you, <coughs> beckoning you to turn, to come to and cleave to him. Come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come, take, eat. Yes, we still suffer. Yes, we still bear crosses. My grace is sufficient. I know what I'm doing. I'm working all things for good, for the good of all those who love me. My grace is all sufficient. You're okay. I have it. The Holy Spirit of God, proceeding forth from the Father and the Son, He works in us and enables us to hear see and to 
receive these blessed realities of salvation. The Holy Spirit of God works that life-giving, life-saving miracle in you through the hearing of God's voice, through God's word, opening your ears, your hearts, and your mind to recognize and to give thanks for the blessed joy and the peace and the wisdom that is Christ crucified. My dear fellow children of God, I don't have answers for you, at least not the answers that you might be looking for. Like St. Paul, I point to Almighty God. I point you to the Almighty and the all-powerful God who fills heaven and earth, whose voice created everything out of nothing and whose voice still shakes the heaven. I point you to Almighty God, whose voice cried out in victory, it is finished, and who still bears the cruciform scars as an eternally blessed reminder to his heavenly Father that all the work, all the requirements, all the wrath, all the suffering has been paid in full. And that's a lot of other all. All the full righteous and fiery wrath of God. All of that against sin is poured out on Christ and not on us. And so I direct your ears, your ears of faith to his voice, which still cries out, still proclaims your innocence, your justification, your peace. Those words of absolution and benediction that you hear aren't the mere words of men who simply like tradition. These are the timeless and eternal words of God for you. By the working of the Holy Spirit, you believe and hold fast to these words of life, of wisdom, and of peace. It's kind of one of those, when you get it, you get it kind of. When you trust and hold fast to God's given eternal wisdom, it rocks your world. It shakes your foundations. It shakes you up for joy. Everything else in life tends then to get put in the proper perspective when you consider it in the light of Christ Jesus. Everything is simple. So simple, so powerful, so wise, so beautiful. Everything else pales in comparison. Everything else becomes, in many ways, a lot more powerful, more manageable, more bearable, and dare I say, even sometimes more joyous. Everything else seems a bit foolish or petty in the light of the cross of Jesus. And that is as it should be. And that, brothers and sisters, is all. Again, the word. We give thanks in all circumstances, in all places, in all times. For you are ever and always redeemed in Christ and because of Christ. And so let us give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy and his wisdom and his love for you endures for you. May the peace of God surpass us all wisdom. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.